Lurie, a professor, a professor in the School of Public Affairs and Administration at Rutgers University, Newark. Thank you very much for joining us this evening for a forum on Rutgers University, Newark's responding to the Afghan crisis. This forum came out of several discussions as many of the speakers and others were in conversations several week, weeks ago, watching much of what the world watched as people began to evacuate from Afghanistan, many of whom um, ended up arriving in the US and other countries. In total, there were over 100,000 people that were airlifted in a very, very short period of time, a number of whom have been settled um, in the United States and are currently in different military bases around the country. Over the next year, many of them will be settled into communities around uh, the country. And we wanted to spend some time this evening speaking with some specialists who are in the field, as well as students and alum and faculty and others, just to begin to explore what the Rutgers University Newark community might do to assist many of those who are being resettled. We have a number of speakers this evening and I'll introduce them momentarily. Um, our format is we'll spend a little bit of time looking at things that Rutgers University Newark uh, members can, can do. We'll look at some things that students in particular might be able to do. And then we'll also have some time to explore um, some questions that people might have of ways that, that we can get engaged. So let me, let me without hesitation, um, go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Najma Hassan, who is a recent alum of the School of Public Affairs and Administration. And Najma has been doing quite a bit of organizing locally within um, our, our local Afghan community um, to work um, in support of some of the people that have been um, evacuated. So Najma, over to you. Thank you, Kyle. Hi, everyone. First and foremost, I wanna thank you all for joining on this event tonight. We're living in unprecedented times and sometimes I think it's good to gather around and discuss what we as a community can do to uplift and support parts of us that are hurting. Like Kyle said, my name is Najma Hassan and a bit of background about myself. I was born and raised in New Jersey and I'm a proud Rutgers Newark School of Public Affairs and Administration graduate. During my time at Rutgers, I was active in multiple student organizations and I'm also a child of Afghan refugees. Though my parents fled war and persecution for a second chance at life, as a byproduct of that immigration, I'm living proof that welcoming enough refugees really makes a difference. Being a student, I spent a lot of my time getting involved in student life from organizing events to spreading awareness on social justice issues. I started college in 2015. Those were times of uncertainty from the Muslim ban to the suspension of DACA. That kind of uncertainty didn't leave us with many options. All we knew is that we had to stand up and fight back. We started organizing protests and calls to actions. And in these times, the Rutgers community has always come together and mobilized to enact change. During these dark times, we were blessed to have the support of the Rutgers Newark faculty. I and many other students were thankful for them and their commitment to the students that Rutgers, that called Rutgers home. While those days are behind us, they're not entirely over yet. I know I'm not alone when I can say, I can't help but feel helpless as I watch my parents' homeland and the people suffer through even more violence, destruction, and displacement. At this point, the entire world is watching Afghanistan. But the Afghan diaspora is doing impressive and effective work. They're advocating, donating, volunteering, lending their expertise in their own respective areas of work. Currently in New Jersey, there are groups being organized. There are coalitions of ragtag community members, children of diaspora, some people whose ties to the country are at this point mere threads or even non-existent, advocating, donating, packing up goods and sending them off at a rapid turnover rate. There have been clothing drives in the ICPC mosque, Muhammadiyah mosque, Imam Ali mosque. And these are only to name a few. Online fundraisers are being held, organizations who are on the ground are being promoted on social media pages, and our allies are putting in work. And they all hold this similar thought of, if not me, then who? If I don't do this right now, how will it ever get done? They're helping address the humanitarian issue in Afghanistan, commemorating the vulnerable Afghans left behind, and also preparing themselves for incoming refugees. At an expensive cost too, the very nature of this work involves exposure to trauma that can lead to burnout and stress, and whether you've directly been exposed to war and experienced refugee-related trauma or not, as a diaspora, we're all affected. And I know I've seen it personally with my own parents. As the constant news of updates of Afghanistan continues, 
those with past traumas of this war may be triggered or re-traumatized by news, images, and videos. In regards to moving forward, some actions we can take as a community, Rutgers Newark has access to a large network of people willing to go out there and do the work. People like us who are gathered here on a Thursday night to find out how we can help. These refugees coming in are people like you and I, and I implore Rutgers to look into providing scholarships for incoming refugees. I know Bard University in New York, as well as various other universities are keeping the refugees in mind and making education more accessible. Additionally, there's a need for mental health professionals, preferably ones who can speak Pashto or Dari. And many of these in incoming refugees are facing extreme trauma and just need someone to talk to. I ask Rutgers to assist in also gathering those and providing them to the refugees at Fort Dix. So I can close with one of my favorite poems that I look to when I'm feeling a bit hopeless. And this is by Farouk Farzad, a Persian poet. It goes, dreams always fall from their native heights and die. And on the soil where old beliefs silently rest, a little plant with four tiny leaves constantly grows. I smell this plant. So like this tiny plant, I'm hopeful for a better tomorrow, but the people of Afghanistan don't need your sympathy. They need action, they need help, they need the world to take responsibility and they need people like you. Thank you and I will pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you, Najma. I'd like to turn things over to Courtney Manson, who's the Director of Church World Services of Jersey City. Courtney. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I am here with my fellow resettlement agency, um, Interfaith Rise, um, who will speak in a moment. Um, just a quick summary of what uh, refugee resettlement agencies do. Um, we, there are nine national resettlement agencies who have a contract with the US Department of State to provide resettlement services. Um, those services um, locally include housing, general case management, referral to services, um, enrollment in school, um, is providing them linkages to public benefits and other kind of necessary basic needs support. Um, offices like CWS, Jersey City, and Interfaith Rise also provide ongoing services um, through various programs and uh, different grant programs uh, locally. Um, Specifically for this Afghan response, we are looking at a special program that is going to be stood up by the Department of State with the resettlement agencies in partnership um, called the Afghan Parolee Assistance Program. Um, the details of this program are still being worked out. What we know for sure is that the resettlement agencies will be involved and that the three agencies that will be most involved here in New Jersey are CWS, Interfaith Rise, and the IRC in Elizabeth. Um, I wanted to take a minute before I hand it over to Seth um, just to differentiate between the response that New Jersey has on the base down at Fort Dix and the, re the response that the resettlement agencies will have um, through our resettlement program. The people who are on the base um, right now in New Jersey and across the United States, um, they are going through um, essentially an immigration processing uh, protocol. Um, and with the intention that after they kind of make it through that process, they will then be um, ready to travel on to agencies like CWS or Interfaith Rise for permanent resettlement. Um, so there, while there are people on the base at Fort Dix, it's not clear how many of those people will actually remain here in New Jersey for permanent resettlement. Um, there is an expectation that most people have connections um, here in the United States, um, as Najma referenced, um, and they will want to travel to be closer to, to family and friends um, that it's just easier for resettlement that way. Um, with that said, we do expect um, there to be resettlement, permanent resettlement of Afghan refugees here in New Jersey. Um, we're anticipating ac across all of the agencies in the state, less than a thousand people um, will be permanently resettled in the state. Um, while the details of what this resettlement is going to look like on the ground and when this is gonna happen is still very much um, being worked out um, both through our federal partner agencies and quite frankly in Congress um, right now. There are some things that resettlement agencies know that um, groups like you 
can do to start getting involved right now. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Seth just to talk a little bit about what some of the responses have been that we've seen um, through our agencies so far. Thanks, Courtney, and thanks Rutgers Newark for, for tonight and for just the chance to talk with all of you. Um, Najma, I'd, I'd love to hear more about your story and about your family. Um, I'm really glad we started off with you because um, that really, really hits um, kind of what, what this is mostly about. Um, um, so yeah, I want I to just pick up where Courtney left off and say there's a, there's a whole lot of things that are similar between um, resettling this group of Afghan people and other resettlement work we do. And there's things that, are, that we anticipate being different. It's at least different up front. And the big difference is we really don't know what um, people will be able to access in terms of public services and what they won't. Um, we have like drawn up the worst case scenario. If we resettle nearly a thousand people, we imagine that for six months, we might collectively need a $2 million um, uh, amount of money to fill the gaps that would have been provided through public services. Um, that would be the worst case scenario. If different legislation occurs at the federal or state level, that could be dramatically reduced. And we sure hope that with the eyes of the world on this situation, Congress and the administration will, will work effectively to, um, to make it be easier for Afghans to, to resettle here, despite the fact that they don't have completed papers and, and such. Um, but what we're seeing locally is just tremendous. I'll give a couple examples. Um, a few nights ago, a local housing authority, um, actually in Princeton, had a meeting and decided that over two months this fall, one month they'll give a three-bedroom apartment to an Afghan family coming in through the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program. Um, and the next month they'll, they'll do a two-bedroom. Um, and that's just phenomenal um, that different groups are, are doing what they can to make, to clear the way for permanent housing. Um, housing is always the hardest thing for refugee resettlement agencies in New Jersey. The cost is, is so high that even a family of five, like there's never enough money coming in for security deposit in two months or three months rent. Um, and, you know, in this case, we're going to see significantly less money and we don't know when it will come. Um, so any, anybody who can help open up the doors of housing, um, that's phenomenal. Um, our agency has been able to rent 10 houses already um, in the last three weeks because of all the people who've called us, landlords who've called us and said, hey, I've got something coming up. And before I put it out on the open market, I wanted to know if you want to rent it. And we've said, yeah, well, we'll take that place on November 1. We'll take that place on October 1. And we've got the places lined up. And it's really wonderful for, for landlords to say, you know, sight unseen. Um, sure, uh, a family that's approximately this many people and um, yeah, we'll say yes to that family um, because they're part of this system and because they're supported by this organization. So one thing that students and, and faculty can do is talk to the people who own um, the housing stock around you um, and, and just be thinking about long-term permanent housing. People have been incredible with their outpouring of offers of their guest rooms and their basements and other places is for people to stay. And while that's wonderful, for people who are coming out of trauma and have then been sleeping on a cot for, you know, two months or whatever at a base somewhere, somewhere in the world, not just New Jersey, it might be Texas, might be Germany, might be the Middle East somewhere, um, for them to then be um, rerouted to have to be a good guest in someone else's house mm -hmm. is really hard. People are really tired and, and traumatized. So while we're pre appreciative of sort of piecing it together, we're mostly hoping to be as ready as we can to move people into permanency as quickly as possible. Um, so those are a, a few of the things. Um, one thing that I know we will need, and this is true of all of our agencies, um, is, is furnishing, but not now. And I will say that um, we, we had an awful lot of wonderful offers of, um, you know, beds and bureaus and all of that. But because we don't know where people will be living, um, it doesn't make sense for us to collect a lot of things in Jersey City if um, CWS ends up having a lot of their families resettled 40 miles away from Jersey City. Or for us in New Brunswick, um, you know, we're close to New Brunswick we're here in Highland Park. If it turns out a lot of our families are resettling far from here. So um, 
you know, just being able to call our agencies and say, I have things and then be willing to hold things and let us put it into a database so that we can re reach out to you when we need um, another chest of drawers or a kitchen table um, and work it out in, in real time. Um, that's a really wonderful thing. And also just sort of patience with our groups. Um, the groups above us at the national level are asking us to be patient and we're trying hard because um, uh, they, you know, even our Washington based, um, you know, mothership organizations have so many questions and, and, and don't have all the answers. And, um, and then the people in the communities are wanting answers from us that we can't uh, necessarily have right now either. So um, just keep paying attention to our websites, interfaithrise.org. Um, Courtney, what's your website? Is it cws.org or, or? Yeah, and we can put that in the chat. Yeah, as well, yeah. Our website. Um, yeah, and IRC also is, is you know, going to be resettling uh, more than both CWS and Interfaith Rise. So th those are the three together who are, are working on this. And um, yeah, just thanks so much for a chance to share a little bit about ways to help. Courtney and Seth, before we go to, um, to our next speaker, um, you mentioned things such as furniture. Um, I'm wondering if you could give us a, a little bit in terms of clothing or other other goods. Um, I know a lot of people are interested in doing clothing drops. Um, should we hold off on that, or is that something that is recommended at that at this particular stage? I, I would suggest holding right now, um, only because once again, um, you know, we're not talking about massive numbers. We're talking about big numbers, but not massive numbers and. Sometimes the clothing drops very quickly become more massive than what the actual arrival numbers will be. So, um, you know, um, if there's brand new stuff, I'm not going to turn it away. That's for sure. But um, it, at least at our at our facility, we, we have a sign up that says we'll look through things that come in um, and be very picky and choosy. And then we have a thrift shop here, which will sometimes, um, you know, find very nice things to put into the households of new arrivals, but we make it clear that like we're, we can't commit that every item given is going to end up at the home of a newly arrived Afghan family. Um, and we just don't want anybody to, to get that impression uh, because it, just the flow of people is slow right now and the flow of, of stuff coming in is not slow. Um, so we, we're just wanting to be a little bit careful for, uh, you know, on, on this side of things right now. Courtney, I assume you have something similar? Yeah, I'm even uh, even more hesitant to accept donated items at this point, just because we don't have storage space for it. Um, and we we know that many uh, all of the bases have received a, a large amount of uh, donated items that they are working on distributing to people who are on base. Um, we we recently heard from. Um, some partners who are working on at Fort Dix that they have three warehouses full of unsorted donated items at this point. So we really want uh, to wait until we see to meet the families themselves, kind of see what needs have already been met on the bases, and then what needs need to be um, met once they get to us. Um, and we we know the community will respond um, when we ask. Um, so for now, we are we are asking uh, for to hold on, hold on to your items. Hey, thank you, thank you. Let's now turn to Rick Garfunkel, um, who is the director of Rutgers Global. Rick. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I work at Rutgers Global. This is the global office of Rutgers University uh, located in New Brunswick. We were involved starting in, I would say, mid-July with starting to help some people uh, uh, evacuate from, from Afghanistan. And one of the people wasn't what was called uh, an international woman of courage. She won one of these big State Department awards about 10 years ago, and she runs a whole bunch of shelters and, and homes for women and, and girls. She's involved in schools and education of girls. She had to leave. She, her life was uh, threatened many, many times, and she had had many problems in the past 10, 15 years. So she was one that we helped. She is now in Germany with her family. Uh, and actually, I'll be speaking again with her tomorrow morning. 
she, like many of the people that, if any of you have been involved with any of the evacuees are, as was mentioned earlier, they're, they're living through, you know, trauma, serious trauma, and they're, they have, you know, survivor guilt in some cases of, of their friends back home. So there, there are mental health problems, which have really haven't been mentioned that much yet, but those are very serious problems, which inside the university, RBHS has actually offered to help with. We are still involved with trying to get a few more people out, some lawyers from the University of Kabul who were actually gonna to come uh, to Newark or in part uh, join with Newark. And they, like other people that we know are uh, underground and in, in hiding and trying now mostly overseas, uh, excuse me, overland routes uh, as, as the flights for people like them have been pretty much stopped. Um, we did, the people that we did get out, we gave Jeff, uh, a J and F visas, so they did not come on, on P or SIV uh, kind of visas. They're not refugees or asylees when they arrive in the U.S., but they actually can come directly to the university after they go through, you know, COVID screening and things like that. We are working quite closely with um, IIE in New York, the Institute for International Education. Rutgers partners with them on a bunch of things. I think some of you in the audience know about them. Also with Scholars at Risk. Uh, we uh, still have no major funding as was also mentioned before, we're all waiting for major funding to show up from Congress. There have been requests. I, I know of people who have been involved in those discussions with Congress and, and with the White House. Uh, there's uh, two or three separate channels to try to get federal funding that are going on. And then we know of uh, many initiatives with uh, private organizations and foundations where there could be some money that would support what was been mentioned before, who's gonna support housing. In our case, we will uh, probably work mostly with, uh, at the university, trying to bring in students and scholars who, who make sense for universities, Rutgers Newark, Rutgers New Brunswick, Rutgers Camden, or actually any of the uh, state universities or even private universities. We're involved in some of those uh, activities which would bring them into, into universities. We also had connections with, uh, with Fort Dix, as was mentioned, they are absolutely saturated with, in terms of donations and the Red Cross who was helping oversee are saturated. So that's where a lot of people wanted to donate. It's we're just been told enough is enough now. Let's, if you, if you really wanna contribute money is what we need now, once the refugee resettlement business gets, it gets started and running up uh, to, to a fast level. Also inside the university, there are workshops, informational events, town halls like this one and a round table, some more academic, some about, about sort of social service kinds of things that can be done, both of which will be useful. There's groups within the university, uh, like from the law schools and some others, who would like to offer legal help and, and, and immigration related help. Not clear how much they'll be needed because there's certain standard routes that, that people are following who are uh, in, the, in the camps now. And I think that will be standardized and they may not need external legal help, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I would trust what the resettlement people who are in the call, uh, Courtney and Seth and, and Najam probably know better than I do about how, how that's gonna work once people do get out. Um, again, we're, we're, we're thinking of uh, also connecting if, if some of the refugees, in particular students, are, are stuck in the camps for an extended period of time, we're thinking of ways where we could start language training and other training in there and academic kind of courses while they're in there. So we're, we're trying to find out, and this one is one of the requests I have in for Fort Disc, I haven't heard back yet. Uh, do they have enough computers for kids and, and, and uh, mobile phones for kids to connect to the outside world as they start getting used to their new life? Um, housing remains an issue. Uh, the university does have some housing available and, they, and some of us are pushing them to see if that can be used for in the short term for resettlement. Money obviously associated with this, and to be honest, the university doesn't have enough staff to, to take care of all the housing that they, that they have right now. They're having problems doing that. Uh, we'll probably have a general event for Rutgers within a week or two. Um, on the call now is Anu Gupta, who's happening, happening, uh, helping me from the Rutgers Global Office, and another colleague, Catherine Roscoe, uh, will be uh, involved in that. And I'll certainly be in close contact with Kyle through all of this. And Seth, I should be talking with you since you're right across the river from me. Um, I think that's all I have for now, Kyle, back to you. 
Thank you, Rick. I'd like to now turn things over to two of our students who've been um, working on um, issues both directly related to um, to um, the situation in Afghanistan and then also to broader um, refugee advocacy efforts. So first, let me turn things over to Sarwar um, Sultani, who's a doctoral student in the Division of Global Affairs. And then after Sarwar, Hordia Tafach, who's also a doctoral student in the Division of Global Affairs. So Sarwar, first over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Kyle. Um, I'm grateful for this, this effort. Um, I um, must mention that I, um, I'm directly involved with, in communication with some of the um, people who are on the list of evacuee, possible evacuees, and currently in Mazar. Um, my family members are there in that group. These are the charter flights that were supposed to take off a while ago. And uh, because Eric mentioned the, the trauma, um, I uh, couldn't help but, but mention that um, this trauma is very real because imagine being um, considered as a group that has worked with international forces or is affiliated with international security forces that has been evacuated from one province, Kabul, Mazar, or any other province to a different province for evacuation to be taken to Tajikistan, US or any other place, and then put in a building for nearly two weeks. And over time, after the first few days, you realize that the Taliban and ISIS may already know and know where you are and that you're, you're probably among 250 to 300 other Afghans who are affiliated. And knowing about the fact that these terrorists have targeted um, people vulnerable like that while they were trying to leave the country in the airport. Um, living with that trauma means that every time you hear a little bit of noise or a gunshot that is, happens every hour in Mazar, you feel like they're probably coming after you and going to enter your building. So that's the kind of trauma um, Eric was mentioning. And it is very difficult for people. So um, I hope there are individuals and groups here that recognize that. I appreciate the fact that Eric mentioned and highlighted how important that is to be able to have programs in place that address those issues when, um, when these people come in. Um, my intention here was to talk about the education aspect and I, um, I wanted to talk about first about women because one of the groups that um, is often ignored here, I'm not talking about girls, but women who come as wives um, of these SIV uh, applicants or SIV uh, immigra immigration recipients. And, and when they come here, oftentimes because they focus so much on having to look after their children or just you know being a housewife, that some of them with good qualification and educations are often left out um, of possibilities of exploring that education venue as, a, as an option. And um, it came to me uh, very clear through uh, my organization when I opened the application for online English language classes, um, when 90% of the applicants were women who, who had with kids. And most of them say that they did not have any other opportunity when they found out that this class is online because they don't have time to drive, they cannot drive to anywhere to study, that this made it easier for them to, to just start learning from home while they can look after kids. Um, I also wanted to ask Eric um, um, if you could please elaborate a little bit more on the uh, scholarship and educational programs that you um, you said you're working on. Um, I think that's very significant. Uh, that's very significant for a number of different reasons. One is that a lot of Afghans um, um, have been in the last 20 years, a good generation of Afghans have been able to earn a good level of education, either through scholarships um, and educational op opportunities abroad or within Afghanistan. And unfortunately, 
they have not at the current with the current situation a lot of them will be looking forward to opportunities to work and support themselves when they come here if there is a way to to recognize the fact that i know many afghans right now and they are not coming in, i mean people who came in through regular siv applications who have a degree in engineering a degree um, in medicine and they are uber drivers um, um, and they are a security guard officer i know them personally and some with 10 years of experience of working with international organizations a senior management positions driving uber this is an issue that could be avoided if a good strategy and plan is made in terms of utilizing the skills that already these people have and they bring in to to build up on those skills to prepare them for for the job market i hope there's sufficient work and attention that will be paid on that um i also wanted to talk about uh, cultural integration um and a lot of these people come in from a very different world. They come in from a very different perspective. Now, maybe one of the kids who work with the US forces or who can speak English um, or who work with an international organization knows very much what life in the US uh, or how to interact with it. But many people in, that, in a single family, maybe brothers, sisters who come in with the same family may not know. And if it's important not just to focus on engaging and integrating people who already know and speak English, but people who may have those limitations um, and not at the same level of knowledge and information about a life in the US. So, they, so that kind of knowledge and transfer about American society and culture is very important. And I think one group that can really pay, play an important role in that is the Afghan diaspora. And there are multiple networks of Afghan diaspora that have been trying to engage one way or another. But I think even a single family that come in, comes in, being put in touch with a single family that already lives here for constant support, regular, regular communication and contact could make a big difference. All right, I'm, I know I'm supposed to keep it short, so I'll end it there. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sawar. Um, and I'd like to turn things over to Hori Tapesh. Sure. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, so I will be talking more, mostly about how student could help or how student can support in the uh, refugee related issues. I'm going to be, be talking about and um, very shortly about an organization that we started last year in the World Refugee Day, which is called the Student Voices for Refugees. Uh, through this organization, we are hoping to empower some student leaders on campuses who would support our efforts or engage in even um, formulating strategies on how we can support refugee students on campuses through mentorship and scholarship programs. And I'm gonna be sharing my screen just to show you where you can find more information about this organization. Like last, uh, I think in June, we have published this toolkit. The toolkit is like, you can go and, and look around the toolkit, but mainly if you want really, you're a student and you really want to get engaged in refugee related issues, or you want to support refugee um, uh, resettlement, wherever you are, uh, in Newark or not in Newark, you can have a look at the at the toolkit. We are here. You can find the the, mich, the mission and the vision of our of our network, which, as I said, is to create student leaders or student champions on campuses who will support refugee through uh, mentorship and scholarship programs, and even after being admitted to campuses, how can student be of help? Uh, you can find in this sections different definitions that we think that as you as a student, if you want to get involved, you really have to be a bit of educated or have background information about what does refugee mean or what does SIV mean that our speakers were talking about. So this would also give opportunity to look at different definitions. Uh, we have key challenges and recommendations, and most importantly, we have a written guidelines. And this written guidelines, we have two of them. We have the student advocates guide, and that guide you will find a whole lot of information about 
what type of challenges are facing student, uh, refugee student on campuses, or even to access education because we know that our, or as you might know only three percent of refugees have access to higher education so it's really um an urgent matter to act at so student advocates guide if you look at it it have a lot of information about these challenges and how can you as a student help and we have the university guides which talk about more about the administration level, what type of challenges student, refugee students face in order to get to the university after admission and even post-graduation. And how can the university help at each stage? Also, we have this information on the university guides. And lastly, we have the multimedia library. And the multimedia library we have done, we have almost 20 volunteers who have done almost 45 interviews with different organizations. This organization are offering scholarship or mentorship programs for refugee students. So we did some interviews with them and like to, to understand more how they are doing the work. So like if someone is interested in doing the same work, they just can watch the interview, uh, listen to the question that our volunteers ask, how they are doing the work, and then also as SVR, we are very happy if you connect with us, we can connect you with them. And you can, in this case, replicate uh, the initiative that is being done maybe in UCLA at Rutgers Newark. Uh, finally, at Rutgers Newark, now we are looking to start a chapter for Student Voices for Refugees, who would be composed of student leaders who are who are gonna work on let's say establish a strategy on how to engage student body at Rutgers um, in responding to the refugee crisis and supporting refugee students. That's it for me, Guy. To you, Kai. Thank you very much, Rory. Sure. Um, so I'd like to just mention two things that, that are in process. And I don't know if um, Hori, you might be able to minimize the screen there. Um, um, pull off the, the share screen. Yeah. Thank you. So there are two things that I'd like to briefly mention, one of which is that we wanted to use tonight's forum as a beginning of a, of a conversation on what we might be able to do as a community in relation to both the situation um, with people who have, uh, who have left Afghanistan, and then also obviously to, to work on other matters pertaining to, to different refugee communities. So in the next few days, we will be reaching out to everyone who registered for this webinar um, and we'll ask you to, to get involved. Um, we'll have a serving in a committee as one possibility. We'll also send a link to a platform that we're setting up so that if people are interested in making some contributions, they can do so. And we will in turn um, work with our committee to distribute those funds to different organizations that are working um, with who are being resettled um, from Afghanistan. Um, so please keep your eyes and ears open out for, for those emails and just for the conversations that we'll have. And we'll hope that as many of you as possible with, with some of our next steps. Uh, Kyle, can I just mention something? In the email that we will send in the follow-up, also we will include a, a form that our IRC, the Refugee Resettlement Agency, have shared with us uh, that you can fill in terms of what kind of help you think uh, you would you can uh, provide for refugees. Like if you have a housing, if you have a house you want to rent, if you know um, ha available housing, if you know an employers who could uh, hire a, a refugee and all these different types of help that you can provide. Also, we're gonna share the form um, with you guys. And there's another form also uh, on the university partnership that is is also a, a program that is being uh, put together by different universities and the President Alliance for Immigration that we're trying also to find some student leaders that will inform a strategy of how universities can, can sponsor refugee students through to come and study in the US. We are not talking only about the refugees who would be already here, but a kind of taking education as a pathway from overseas to U.S. campuses. All of this information, we're going to include it in the follow-up uh, email. Thank you. Super. Thank you, Hori.
Um, so, so look for those emails, and uh, and again, we're we're hoping to to engage as many of you as possible in in some next step um conversations. We have time for questions, and um, all of our speakers are still here. So why don't we do this? If you have a question um, or a comment, type it into the chat, and I'll go ahead and uh, and read them out. Um, and um, as we're waiting for any questions to pop up through the chat, uh, let me just open it up to see if any of our, our speakers have anything that they'd like to share as sort of final um, bits of, of reflection. I would just like to acknowledge that, um, you know, we've been resettling Afghans for some years, and I know that's true of the other resettlement agencies. So um, it's not completely a, a new, initiative um, and also Rutgers has been involved for, for some years. So currently one of our SIVs who was resettled three years ago is in his junior year at Rutgers, um, New Brunswick and a full scholarship that was made possible through, I don't know what channel of people talking together to say, we wanna make a, a refugee scholarship available at Rutgers University. Um, so there is precedent and I'm sure there's other precedents and other you know, fingers of the institution, there, there's always a million different op opportunities, I know, within large institutions. But um, so a, that's a thank you and a um, just an encouragement that it's already there. There's already stuff going on. And I'm sure there, that more could be could be found where, where there's already a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see a, a question here from Amira, and it's for um, Rick. Um, Rick, you mentioned mental health, and that was strangely a concern for me. Are there resources available for refugee therapy or in the works? Strongly of concern to her. Um, yes, so RBHS has a very large uh, sort of mental health unit with over a thousand people employed in that unit. And there are some people associated with that unit who have said that uh, they would try to organize themselves in such a way that they could be uh, helpful. That has not happened yet. I have not had the conversation with the, the leader of that unit yet, but I know him and, and, and it is up and coming. I mean, these people are obviously fully occupied. Mental health problems have grown nationally, uh, uh, especially during the pandemic. So I don't know how many people and how much time we're going to get, but I think there's certainly a lot of empathy for what's going on right now. And this is, uh, kind of an extreme situation that I'm sure there'll be some involvement from this very large group of mental health experts at Rutgers. So uh, stay tuned and I'll, I'll get back to you and Kyle and uh, Horai and, and company can do the distribution at, certainly at Rutgers Newark, if not larger. Great, thank you. Let's see, we have a few more questions that have come in. Um, it looks like the next one is from um, Zara. One thing that Sarawar said is that if some Afghan Americans can be in contact with even one family, it would be beneficial. How would we get in contact with these families? I think that's a question to, to any of our speakers. I can say that um, the, the form that IRC has, we have a similar form on, on our website for CWS, and I also shared um, Interfaith Rise's um, website as well. We're all um, collecting information about people who want to volunteer um, in that capacity as well. Um, so, I, so I can say if, you, if you're interested in working with uh, resettled families, you know, please reach out to one of the resettlement agencies. I, can, um, I shared the links in the chat, and I'm sure they will be shared out in the follow-up email. Great, thank you. And Najma, can I also spin that question over to you since I know that you're working um, with a lot of the, the members of the, the local um, Afghan community. Are there um, some connections that, that you're seeing right now between families that have been here and the families that might be coming? I think currently the connections are more of getting supplies to the people at the bases. There hasn't been many of face-to-face -face interactions with the refugees. Um, I do anticipate in the future that there will be, but I think it's more currently getting them situated and getting them supplies. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, there's a question from Murat. Recently, I've been involved with many Turkish and Syrian refugees. 
One of the most effective ways to help them was a mentorship program that each family is assigned to a person who's had a similar profession or is resourceful to help in general. They know that they can call this mentor without hesitation to ask questions, even on basic everyday stuff. Is there a program like that for African, um, Afghan refugees that we can work on finding mentors? And I think that in some ways mirrors a little bit of the, the um, question that we just had, but does anyone um, have anything else to add in relation to, uh, to Marat's question? I, I can tell you that the, the approach at Interfaith Rise is over the first um, 30 to 90 days, um, we start by having staff involved with family and then starting to pull in volunteers as we get to know what people's interests are in terms of hobbies, in terms of vocation, um, uh, age of their children, what school district they're in, um, you know, trying to line up to make connections. Our hope is always that by the time we reach the 90 day mark, there's an intentional, compassionate community of friends that have become friends with a family that's arrived. So that as the case management um, lessens, um, the, the friendship base that, um, that really rooted in community has, has grown. It doesn't always work perfectly, but that is always our goal. So it's, it's that kind of mentor approach very much from us, but we, we try to do it as kind of a community. Um, so there's, we call it intentional, compassionate community, that there's a, a community of mentors around every family. And, and Seth, you mentioned the 90 day mark, and I know 90 days um, you know, has a sort of special um, significance in, in the resettlement arena. Can, can you just sort of tell us why 90 days is so critical? So the reception and placement program, which is the, the program that is usually in place for, we'll call it regular refugee resettlement, is a 90 day commitment to help people um, get set up and and rolling. There's a bunch of other programs that folks can qualify for that extend the amount of support they get. Um, and those that can be if there's somebody who's um, in a program that's really employment driven, or if it's a, somebody who is in a program where they're clearly going to need higher level mental health services or other um, health services that will delay independence. So for either fast track reasons or for I'll call it slower track reasons, you can get an extension. But, but we try to think in, in terms of, of a 90 day period as an, as an agency to really help people um, take care of the things that they need to take care of um, health wise, um, referral wise, um, uh, beginning to have an income wise, other things like that to, to by the time we hit the 90 day mark, um, folks are not, not good to go, but are are far advanced and, and there's, a, there's large checklists of things that our case managers are required to fulfill during those first 90 days around the categories that I just mentioned. Great, thank you. We're not sure with the Afghan um, program if, if it will all be the same. And um, some of that has completely to do with benefits. Um, if there's no benefits, if you can't work at the end of 90 days because no one's figured out how to get a work permit in the hands of these folks, it's a very different picture, um, for example. So, I mean, that's just one example of the gaps that um, are in place. If you can't qualify for food stamps, if you can't qualify for, for TANF and therefore you're not eligible for temporary rental assistance, even though you're a, a single um, adult with five children, um, that's gonna be, those are gonna be big, big issues. Great. I see a question from Destiny. It sounds like this organization has been very successful in aiding Afghan families in the resettlement process. What areas do you feel are unsuccessful and have a greater need for others to help? And I'm not quite sure um, when um, Destiny is referring to this organization, which organization. So maybe we can just think about you know, some of the organizations that are represented or others that you've seen that you've seen things that that have been less successful and perhaps need um, greater assistance. or challenges that, I, that, um, that, that you've seen? Yeah. I, I, I mean, want to say, go ahead, Courtney, sorry. I was just going to kind of um, amplify something that Seth said that is uh, very particular to this um, Afghan evacuee situation is that the Congress needs to act 
um, in order for us to provide them with a successful and uh, well-rounded resettlement experience. Um, and so I think that's something that this group in particular could really step up to do is contact elected officials, particularly the congressional delegation to let them know that um, they need to take action to support Afghans in their communities. Otherwise, all they're gonna get is this 90 day service, right? And that's not sufficient. That is not what they need. And we all have heard multiple examples of why that is. So um, I would say most like right now, that is the thing that we are all looking towards and waiting for um, because then from, from there, then we can start you know, planning and, and there can be a cascade of other decisions that come through. Great. So, so make sure that uh, that elected officials you know, are seeing these needs and and are acting as um, as we hope that they will. Um, there's a question um, about volunteering to help teach English or tutoring children as they ramp up schools. Um, I'm wondering if we might be able to get a, a response to that. But then also, we talked about donated items. We talked about um, contributions, um, but we didn't really talk about um, volunteering. So can we get both an answer to if someone wants to help with English tutoring um, or someone wants to volunteer in general, um, are there opportunities? And um, if there are, how might they find out about them? And if they're not, what are some of the different um, backlogs just to be aware of? I'll, I'll answer that and then I'm gonna have to leave because I have to run a meeting at seven o'clock. So this will be my last chance to say a word and, and to thank you all. Um, yes, we love volunteers who can help with tutoring. Um, currently, this past year, um, every, every person that we've resettled had an, a personal English tutor, um, and every child had at least one academic tutor, all volunteers. And uh, we had lower numbers because of the last administration and COVID and other things, but still, um, you know, we were well covered. If we suddenly add a couple hundred extra people in our organization that we weren't anticipating. We will need more volunteer tutors um, in the different academic subjects that you all are brilliant in, I'm sure. So um, so sign up at any of our websites. And I'm sure Courtney would say the same thing, that that kind of tutoring will be very helpful. However, be patient with us. I mean, currently, uh, we've had one SIV family arrive since Kabul fell, and we've had um, one parolee family uh, so far. So two families and, and one of them is like in a very sort of restricted situation right now. So they're not really accessible to volunteers. So the, the outpouring of concern and support is ahead of the, you know, the folks coming out of any base. Um, it, it's just going to take a little time. I mean, people need vaccinations and I'm not talking about COVID-19. They're going to need all the other vaccinations you need to come into this country, and um, that takes longer. And there's other protocols that are are going to take a while at these bases. So sign up and then wait. Thanks. Thank you very much, Seth. If I might just add to um, to that that point that Seth was making, I was on a a, um, a call the other day and um, heard from one of the the large agencies that they had over forty thousand people who had signed up wanting to volunteer. Um, mm -hmm. So. Um, to echo that um, if you do want to do direct volunteering, um, be patient because there is an infrastructure that's very rapidly coming into place. Um, and, and part of the reason that we're trying to channel some of our activities um, from Rutgers in this coordinated way is to try to be as, a, as, you know, as best service and used to the organizations that are at the front lines. So, um, so we'll be happy to, to Look at ways that we can have coordinated volunteer efforts and then work with some of the partner organizations as well. Um, thank you, Kyle. I just wanted to say that my organization, Simplified Global Education, also um, recruits volunteer English language teachers. Um, even though we have mostly focused on local speakers who can speak either Dari or Pashto, that's mainly because a lot of the participants, these women are very much in very beginner level and not, not knowing the local language, it makes it difficult. But uh, we are expecting a large number of applicants with a higher level English where the um, um, native English speakers could be teaching. So I, I would appreciate any volunteers interested. It'll be happy to coordinate on that. Great, thank you, Sarwar. We have um, a 
few minutes left. I don't know if um, if any of the um, speakers um, have any quick wrap up comments. Um, and I'll just I'll just go through quickly. I Rick, I know that you've got to leave um, at seven exactly. So did you want to um, have any wrap up thoughts? Not really. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, uh, you and uh, UARRM team, Horizon Company, for for all the work that you do. Um, and I do encourage, as was mentioned, uh, you have to stay the course for this. This, uh, the interest of many people in the newspapers have already sort of dropped this, and over the next month, much less. But the but the need and the and the work to be done is, you know, months and years, not not just the excitement of the news channel. So keep that in mind. Uh, and I hope that, uh, as also was mentioned before, that the systems and platforms that are built for this, that sort of build upon already what Courtney and Seth and company do for a living, uh, can, can grow such that uh, we don't have to build this from scratch each time there's another global crisis. So please, uh, please keep in touch and, and help build a platform that involves the universities in a, in a more substantial way, like UARRM's group and other groups like that. Talk to your friends at other schools and, and try to build these kinds of programs elsewhere. That's it. Thank you. Courtney, any wrap up um, thoughts from your side? Courtney, are there any um, wrap up thoughts with you or no? Okay. Thank you very much then. Um, Najma, any, any wrap up thoughts from your side? Uh, I just wanted to thank you all again for joining tonight, Kyle, for having me. Um, really appreciate the steps that are being taken to help the community. So thanks again. Thank you. Sarwar? Um, yeah, again, I wanted to say thank you. I, it's amazing to see so many people working so hard to, to help these people arriving. Um, I am grateful for the empathy uh, for your hard work. Um, and these people are really in need and you're the work you're doing is really going to change lives of millions, hundreds at least, if not thousands or millions of people. So thank you very much for your work. Thank you. And Seth? This is going to sound like a funny way to end this, but I, I don't know that I've met any people in New Jersey who are bigger fans of New Jersey than Afghans. Um, the number of Afghans who, who say what an awesome state we have is incredible, um, at least in my in my network. And it's just something to think about that this, um, with all the pain and struggle, there's also this incredible opportunity for New Jersey to receive people who love New Jersey for what it is, as an incredibly eclectic, um, multi-faith, multi-ethnic kind of place. Um, the mosques in this area are just incredible. I love, I love every mosque in this area. And I really just feel that um, you know, New Jersey has every reason to be a place for Afghans to be, and um, New Jersey is going to be a better place for Afghans making this a permanent home. So, you know, the more we can do to kind of put out a welcome mat for people who are already very much like Jersey fans, um, this is this is really a special time, I think, for New Jersey to to shine and and have Afghans be part of that. So, thank if you. I if I could add to that, and I must say, because having lived in multiple states um, with Afghan and being in touch with the Afghan community, I can say that that is really true uh, with Afghan community in ev everywhere across the US. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, excellent. Great, thank yeah. you. Thank All you. Right. Take care. Um, great, Hori, as, my, uh, as a co-organizer here with us, any, anything to wrap up on your end? Uh, I'm good. Just like watch out our uh, email with the follow up forms and, and the way to get involved in the longer term strategies. Great. Thank you. And a uh, quick thanks to all of our um, co-sponsors, the School of Public Affairs and Administration, Sharon Story. Thank you for helping us with, with organizing this um, to the Rutgers University Law School, um, to the um, program in Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies and to the Graduate School of Rutgers University, Newark. Um, thanks, everybody. Please look for communications from us in the next few days, and we look forward to working with all of you um, in terms of helping to, to um, mobilize some great activity with, uh, with these communities that are, that are joining us. Have a great evening.